Who are you? What did you come here to do? Do you know who you are inside? Do you take pride in being you? Well, I sure do hope that you do. I sure do hope that you do because you are not who you think you are. You're not who other people think you are. I mean, what did you come here to do? Everybody comes here with a purpose that's unique to you. Everybody comes here with talents that's unique to you. So here's a big clue that will probably do more question evoking than solution giving for you. You're not your body. You're absolutely not your body. And you're not your mind. How do I know this for a fact? for an absolute fact and not because a bunch of people have been teaching this forever. Many, many years ago, in fact, in less than a month, it will be 22 years since my mom transitioned. Now, here's where I learned it. You see, my mom at the age of 80, something happened in her brain and she started seeing things that the rest of us couldn't see. Notice that I say that the rest of us couldn't see because I'm not really sure they weren't there. She'd see like Civil War people and we live someplace where the Civil War happened, where lots of people were killed, where Clara Barton tended to the Civil War wounded. So she was in another world and I'm coming from a place of, well, I was at that time. No, I wasn't any longer at that time, but I did come from a background of psychology, a mainstream psychotherapist is what I was doing. And there was not really a whole lot mainstream about the way I was doing it. So I never thought that my mom was really weird. In fact, when theory, which kind of really jived in my belief system was, if someone doesn't listen to you, and I think I could have done a better job listening to my mom at the time. At the time, I raised two kids who were performers. That meant even though my dad was a stay-at-home mom, I was never home. I was always driving the lessons or rehearsals or performances. One day I lived in a DC area. I drove the entire beltway. This is a big circle around DC. I drove the whole thing because of lessons and rehearsals and performances. So no, I really didn't pay as much attention to my mom as she really deserved. Everybody deserves to get the kind of attention that they need that lets them know they matter, they're important. I did tell her I love you a lot and I spent time with her. It just wasn't, I don't think it was as much as she or I bottom line wished it could be. So when she started having these symptoms, one way to describe them is from her point of view, if you're not gonna listen to me and you're not gonna recognize me and I can't be in your world on a more regular basis, I'm gonna go into my own world. So for a long time, I bought into that paradigm. Is it true, is it accurate? I don't know. In any case, the person who wasn't functioning quite the same way she used to, but she was still in this world, in our world. She, uh, it was her body. It was her mind that was doing this. That was her vehicle in this lifetime, not who she is. 
How do I know that? Because five years later, when she had a, a TIA, that, that mini stroke, she lost who she was. Okay. Her vehicle, her body, mind, my mom defining that body, mind, thought she was my child. She thought she was my baby. She thought I was her mother. Her functioning went back to that of about an 18 month old. I had to do absolutely everything for her. So her health was declining. Here's something that's really important for you to know. If you have an aging parent, if your parent's alive, well, duh, they're aging, right? She, and I, oh, bless her, I was going with that. Okay, so she was in this, not knowing who she was, not knowing our relationship. And what I wanted you to know, is doctors tend to all but dismiss somebody who's in their 80s. And we had very not good experiences when I take her to doctors. They'd leave her, I'd never let her be alone in the examining room, but it was like they forgot about her. She was prescribed the wrong medication for an internal affection she had which apparently was what caused her to transition to the next plane. How do I know that? Because the day after returning, the day of returning from her memorial service, right? The phone rings. I answer the phone. It's the gynecologist's office. Now, I'd been giving my mom, actually injecting the medication they had prescribed when they eventually saw her and said, well, this is what's wrong and this is how to fix it. They called to say, our diagnosis is wrong. We gave you the wrong medicine. I said, no kidding. I just came from her funeral and I hung up. Now, <clears throat> just a, a quick note there, because I was just starting to get my life back after a brain injury it took away three years of my life and it was a real struggle it took everything i had to take care of her okay if i had been thinking clearly at the time i would have absolutely without hesitation sued them for malpractice but my mind couldn't do anything but get me through the next few days, few weeks, till I was able to recover from myself. So now let's go back into how I know for a fact you're not your body, you're not your mind. Who you are is awareness. So who is awareness? Awareness is an eternal part of you that goes lifetime to lifetime to lifetime. It's never born. And never dies. When you're seeing your past life, you're seeing different vehicles in which you were moving your soul growth from point A to point B. And they're all cumulative, right? So I've talked about this before. I recognize the interest that I have and the talents and the gifts that I have come from who I was occupying, what vehicle I was in from point A to point B in each of those lifetimes. And they all come together. And it's just as clear as can be. That's where those talents and interests came from. So my mom wasn't my mom. And yet that's how we were functioning in this vehicle, me being me, her being my mom. Now in previous lifetime where we were together, because you often reincarnate with the same souls because there's something, a lesson that you want to learn in a previous lifetime. And this didn't get resolved. So here's a clue for you. We were girlfriends. We were best friends. And we weren't really completely truthful, completely honest 
with one another saying what needed to be said. And so he came back in this lifetime. This time she was my mom. And guess who wasn't completely honest with each other saying what needed to be said? Both of us again. So as I grew up and the situation perpetuate itself and because of the circumstances I mean looking back I could understand why my mom would do or say the things that she said or didn't say but that doesn't mean she was being honest she was doing what she knew so that she can get through her life and taking care of me in the best way that she knew how and because of the feelings I was having, because things didn't feel right to me, I wasn't being honest and upfront with her. Because when I would try to, she knew. Like she'd say things like, I'm so glad you don't have any problems because I don't know what I'd do if you did. If that's not going to stop you from speaking what's on your heart, <laughs> oh, I will, right? So that went on and on. And eventually my mom did tell me how she felt and why she was doing things the way she was doing. And she actually apologized for doing that. And like I said, I could understand that she was doing the best she could. People are always doing the best they can with what they know. So don't be blaming your parents for how they treated you when you were growing up. Just know they're always doing the best they can with what they know. So here we are. And this was why we were actually, my mom was being treated by hospice because she was in such severe pain. And we were waiting for the call to get her into the hospice center, which meant somebody in the center needed to vacate the spot, right? So she's, remember, her status was like an 18-month-old. We didn't have any kind of conversations that I could call normal. And for those of you listening, I'm doing air quotes. And then there were these two times when I was home alone with her. They were two separate times. I was home alone with her. 90% of the time, right? Because my husband went to work or he went to play music or something. I was home alone with her. And it was, I guess it, it was like a miracle. This is how I know. Unquestionably, I know that my mom, that was just her vehicle because this person who thought I was her mom and acted like a little child who couldn't do anything for herself. Out comes this voice and this personality who totally knows what's going on, who's totally coherent, who totally understands everything going on in my world, in the world of her body, mind at the time. And she asked me, oh, well, we had a very normal conversation. We said all the things we both needed to say to be truthful with each other. And it was, it felt really good. And after we said what we needed to say to each other, and that was her awareness, that was not the body mind of my mom in that lifetime. That was her pure awareness. And then it was gone. I couldn't communicate anymore right then. So defining what's pure awareness, as I said, it's the eternal part of you going from lifetime to lifetime. 
it's your awareness who is in utero. It's your awareness who's aware of birth. It's your awareness who's aware of your childhood. It's your awareness who's aware of your teen years and your adult years. It's your awareness who does the experiencing, not your body, not your mind. Your mind is your ego wanting to be in charge. That's not who you are. It's your awareness who says, man, I slept like a baby last night. Well, if you were sleeping and you're your body and you're your mind, how in the world do you know you slept like a baby? Your awareness wasn't sleeping. Your awareness knew that you slept like a body. A body. Your awareness that you slept like a baby all night. So that was the one time. Now, remember I said my mom was at the end. She was getting ready to transition. It was, I, I run energy. Before I ever heard of Reiki or Manahun or anything else, I was running energy because I felt it in me. Because I raised a daughter who was a dancer. What do dancers do? They get hurt often. I didn't know what it was. I just knew I put my hands over her. We both felt heat. She felt better. I'd run energy on my mom regularly. And every time I did, I said to her, you can use this energy to heal or you can use this energy to leave this body mind to go back into awareness to do what you need to do. I said that because I didn't know consciously her awareness was listening. I know looking back, her awareness was listening and she didn't go and she didn't leave. And the pain kept getting worse and worse and worse. And another miracle happened, right? Her awareness came forth to talk to me again. And this time I said to her, because this was the perfectly aware, understanding, speaking in ways that made sense in the moment. And I said to her, why are you hanging around? Why don't you leave? And clear as could be, she said to me, sorry, I get emotional. She said to me, I'm worried about you. She was talking to me. Now, I'm not sure how much of my mom, as my mom in that body mind, understood how much I was struggling because yes, it was three years after that brain injury, but it was a devastating brain injury. And I was just beginning to get some normalcy of life back. And she was worried that I wouldn't be okay if she left. So, okay. Now I understood that's why she was always coming by. She wanted to help with my shopping. She wanted to clean house for me. She wanted to do my laundry for me. She wanted to do everything to help me because she knew it would help me if she did. And of course, on me, I was being super mom and super person and I wouldn't accept any help because in my goofy thinking, <laughs> You're doing this if you're a mom just step back because you might be doing this too i was thinking if i need help then i'm telling the world i can't handle it that's about the dumbest thing you can do okay and i hope i'm reaching somebody who needs to hear that and i'm sure i am so i assured my mom that i'd be okay and it was okay for her to leave because she didn't need to hang around in this body that was hurting. Because what feels the pain awareness? 
So her awareness was quite well aware of the pain going on. So, but then she says something else. She said, he won't let me. I said, he won't let you, who won't let you what? She said, he won't let me leave. She was talking about my brother. He didn't want to acknowledge how sick she was. He wasn't with her round the clock. He didn't see the sharp decline. He didn't see the severe pain. He just knew he didn't want her to leave. Ain't enough to tell her that in words. Things come across in your energy, and she knew that, and she felt that. So after she told me those two pieces, her awareness went out again, and I was back with my mom in that mind body, in that vehicle for this lifetime. So... Where do I go from there? In the hospice, I had said to my mom, please don't leave when I'm not here. And this amazing nurse, I think everybody who works in hospice is an angel. So this beautiful angel said to me, she saw many parents leaving when their kids weren't there. So the morning came and cats are really spiritual. And my cat, my buddy, he's still my spiritual guy. He told me in no uncertain terms, get to the center, your mom is leaving. No, he didn't say it in words, but he gave me awareness. And while I was driving there, and luckily I was with my daughter and her, at that time, very important boyfriend, were with me. And the phone rang and the hospice nurse said, hurry and get here. And we got there, parked the car, and I went in, and I, I was trying to sign in as a visitor. My daughter said, no, Mom, just go. I always pay attention to your kids, even when they're little, but I'm talking about my adult daughter. I went in, and don't you think my mom has just left? So I kissed her and I whispered something in her ear. And this is a fascinating thing. I don't know if you've ever been with anybody when they transition. She had just left. Her body was still warm. And she was like this. Her eyes were looking up. She was seeing something. Her mouth was open. I don't know what she might have said. And my, um, my daughter's boyfriend had just recently lost somebody in the family who was very special to him. And he said, don't you feel her energy? And instead of feeling sad, I felt this extraordinary energy, her great relief of being free from that body, being free from that pain. And as I was feeling that, I saw this golden ball of energy. That was, I call it my mom's spirit. That was her awareness. That was and still is who she is. It's her awareness. And that's how I know. I have known 
doubt whatsoever. I am not this body and I am not this mind and I am awareness. And so are you. And that's the message I really wanted to be sure to get across to you. Because the body you're in is a temporary vehicle allowing you to move from point A to point B. Now you drive a car and it gets you from point A to point B. I would bet you would never consider saying, I'm a car. And I want to share that I took that as an analogy, metaphor from Rhonda Byrne in her newest book, The Greatest Secret, which is where I first understood the difference between body and mind and awareness. It's a great book. I'll put a link to it um, in my podcast episode, both the audio and the video, and in the Facebook too, because I highly recommend it. Now, since then, I've been, the universe has brought me all kinds of philosophers who have been living that for a long time and teaching it and sharing it. And because around this book, I know about a lot of them and I read their work and I follow them. And it's finally beginning to make sense to me. And I hope, I trust, I don't like the word hope. I trust that the words that are coming through me are meant for you to hear them as I'm speaking them. And you wouldn't be here unless this message was for you. I heard some really cool wisdom yesterday or the day before. <laughs> I, I was in a challenge last week. And one day they were talking about how they binge. And they're talking about all these TV shows. And... I don't watch TV shows. I watch, I love documentaries. I watch a lot of science. I watch a lot of philosophy. I listen to a lot of science. I listen to a lot of philosophy. So I wasn't really comprehending why they do that. It's like, I'm going to jump off on a little bit of a weird tangent here. I can't figure out why when people change their eating practices, they, or you look at diet, they have this thing called cheat day. And I'm trying to figure out why. If you're changing the way you eat, if you're changing your lifestyle, and you feel better in this lifestyle, why in the world? Would you want to eat something that you know is bad for you? And here's the thing. I've been eating well for so many years. Your taste change. Your taste when you're eating healthy. When your brain's functioning on fat instead of on sugar. You don't get hungry every one and a half to two hours. That's pretty much insanity. Your brain is not getting hungry very often. Intermittent fasting isn't something that's a chore to do. It's something you do naturally because you're not hungry. And when you eat, the food that you eat is nutritious and you absolutely lose a taste for that junk. I call it rat poison. I stopped eating grains many years ago. <laughs> I'm going to throw out something else so long as I'm on this tangent. The grains, where do you think they go in your brain? They're going right to your opiate center. Yeah, the same place that opium drugs go to. Oh, now here's another interesting piece that fits with the grains. And in particular, wheat, cheese, dairy. Where do you think that goes when it goes into your brain? 
the opiate center. Okay, let me think about this a minute. Wheat, cheese, wheat, cheese. What comes to mind for you? You see them every few blocks, wherever you go, they're pizzerias. Why do people crave it? Why do people salivate when they go by? Why do they get all excited when they know they're gonna eat pizza? Because they know their brain's gonna go, ah, oh, loving it, ah, oh, pure joy. Ah, oh, let's see how many joints we can destroy because that's what happens. <laughs> I'm laughing because I can't, can't figure out how many people I know who had knee replacements and hip replacements where their doctor said, well, you wore it out by using it. Uh, if you're not watching this, if you're listening to this, I got my hands on my head in great confusion. Nature, infinite intelligence, source, universe, God, whatever word you want to use, didn't create your body to get worn out by use. Think about it. Be reasonable. In cultures where people run and walk many miles every day, their joints don't get worn out. If you look at the huge increase statistically in joint replacement, you will see it correlates perfectly with the increase in grains because that we isn't just in a form you see. It's also added to a lot of foods that you eat that you wouldn't guess there's wheat in there. Okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox now in terms of nourishment. What I want to point out to you is when you take care of yourself, when you can notice that that voice going on in your head, it's not you. It's your ego wanting to be in control, being afraid you'll kill it off. What if instead of listening to that voice, you paid attention to awareness? Now, here's something else to think about. I believe it's still in my profile on Instagram. I wrote a paper quite a few years ago about the two voices in your head. One of them is that ego mind wanting to be in control. <laughs> it's what's listening to you right now. You aren't even listening to me. It's telling you what it thinks about what I'm saying to you. It's telling you what it, you, what it agrees with and doesn't agree with and thinks is stupid and thinks it makes sense. You're not listening to me. I call it the commentator because that's what it's doing. But there's another little voice. And you don't hear it all the time. And that's because it's your awareness. It's your spirit. It's your intuition. How do you know which voice is which? Ask a question. That commentator will go, jab, 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 jabber. <laughs> it likes to comment. If it's your intuition, you won't even get an answer. So I'm going to go ahead and leave you now because, oh, I'm sorry. What I was telling you, if you go into Instagram, into my profile, there's something there called Two Voices. And if you click on that, I'm pretty sure <laughs> you'll get the PDF where I go into the description of what I just ran through quickly, the commentator versus intuition, which reminds me. I've been changing a lot of links. I need to go check and be sure it's working right. But you know, go for it. And if it doesn't come to you easily the way I'm expecting it to, just send me a message. And you can always reach me at thrivewithally at gmail.com, which by the way, is my second YouTube channel where I'm focusing solely unhappiness.
And metaphysics is part of happiness because it's the world as it really works. <laughs> I wish you a wonderful day filled with blessings and reminding you to look for the gifts because they're out there, they're surrounding you, they're coming at you and messages nonstop. And you can choose to tune into them. Some people prefer to choose to tune into what hurts and they like to struggle and they literally live their life from crisis to crisis to crisis. That's a choice. Struggle is always optional. Enjoy each moment. I N capital J O Y because everything happens within your awareness. You're not seeing anything out there. You're seeing in here. You're not hearing out there. You're hearing in here. Your taste, your touch, your smell it all happens within. So enjoy every moment. Okay, let's figure out how we stop all these things. I know I can do this. Um, here. <laughs>